Good morning, church. I will be reading from Revelation 2 today, and this is a letter from Jesus to the church in Ephesus. It says, I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You, ha you don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, <laughs> just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Amen. Amen. Uh, thanks be to God for his word to, to us this morning. Um, yeah, just to pick up on, uh, before I jump into this passage, uh, pretty heavy passage, uh, I'll just follow up on what, what D Daniela said. In fact, uh, if you don't think November is here on Tuesday, you will know it's here because it's going to get super cold on Tuesday. Um, and these Advent books that we've ordered actually have, actually have come in. I'm not going to give them to you yet, uh, but they have come in. So if you ordered them, if you paid for them, they're here. We'll, we'll, we'll start distributing them soon. And, uh, and one more week to order them. So get your orders in. We're going to put in one more order, get, get a few more in, uh, and then we'll be, we'll be ready to go. We'll be loaded and ready to go for, uh, for the Advent season. So Revelation 2 passage that Danelle just read. Uh, today what we're looking at is we're looking at uh, Jesus' letter to the church in Ephesus. Uh, the book of Revelation was, was written by John the Apostle uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of course, but, but there's this section in the book of Revelation, just so you understand the context, just so you're not confused by who wrote what. There's this section in, uh, in the early part of Revelation where John says, look, Jesus told me to tell you this. Uh, Jesus, uh, this is a letter. Th these are words straight from Jesus, and they're written to several churches, uh, or, or Jesus' words directly to several churches. And this little snippet, this little, this little passage that we're looking at today, uh, John, the apostle, he writes the book of Revelation. He says, this little paragraph here, it's for you, uh, Ephesians. It's for you, church in Ephesus. It's directly from Jesus to you. But what you need to understand is uh, 2,000 years later, it's for us, folks. Um, this is for River Church. So today we're looking at Jesus' love letter uh, that's written with a, with a very, very pointed intention. Um, the intention is to encourage Christians to rekindle their love for Jesus. As Christians, as Christ followers, uh, and some of us have been Christ followers for decades, as Christians, as Christ followers, some of us have only really been following Christ for a few months or, or a year or two. Uh, a number of you I have baptized in the last 12 months or so. For those of us who are Christians, who are Christ's followers, uh, we, we, are, we are blessed when we seek to rekindle our first love for Jesus. To, to return, when we, when we seek to return to our first love for Jesus. It's like that in marriage, isn't it? It's like that in my marriage. I am blessed when I seek to return to my first love, when I, when I seek to rekindle that first love that I had. 
for, for Lydia, for my main squeeze, for my girlfriend that was my fiance that is now my wife of many decades. I, I need for that love to be rekindled. I need to be reminded of my first love, to fan that flame that it might burn more brightly. Now, now I, have, I have a prop. I have something that I want to show you. It's something special. Uh, Boyce, will you come up here and help me? Um, what I'm going to show you is, is actually over 30 years old, so please um, excuse the condition of it. Um, but here, let's move right here so everybody can see. Right there, okay? All right, this is my son. This is my youngest. My youngest. Okay. You grab that side, and we're going to hold it for you. You've got to use both hands. One on the, that bottom corner, one on the top, because really... Okay. Um, now, here's what I want to show you. Pull that out. All right. Okay. Who, who is that? Uh, who is that? Well, but you don't call her Lydia. Who is this? It's mom. Move over here a little bit. Move over here a little bit. Yeah. That's, that's mom. Um, that's your mother. Uh, so so uh, I went off to college in 1987 and Lydia didn't didn't join me she she went to the same university university that I went to but she didn't she was a year younger she didn't make it out there until 1988 and so it was a whole nine months or so of being mostly apart and we had uh, we had been dating for a couple of years at that point and I'm not sure she knew it, but I already knew that she was the one for me. Uh, and so it was a, it was a long, uh, cold uh, year off at, off at college. And some of you know about that, right, Ron and Sally? Y'all know about being, a, being apart. How long were you all apart while... A year and a half. A year and a half while... Here, while Ron was was serving in the war. Um, today is, uh, well, tomorrow, but this is Veterans Day weekend. I, I thank you, Ron. I thank all of you here who, who have served your country well. Um, so, yeah, Ron was, was off for a year and a half. You all were apart for a year and a half. So you know what that, what that was like. That was like. So, uh, so, so I was in, in Abilene at a, at a small private Christian university and, and Lydia was, was down here and so, uh, so I had this. Actually, she sent me this. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and, I, and I had this on my wall in my dorm room. I did. And, and people would come, guys would, uh, would come to my dorm room and they, and, and this would be on the wall and they'd say, wow, Randy, you're your uh, girlfriend is beautiful and has a really big head. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and she would send me, uh, she would send me letters and they smelled like her. She would like spray them with her perfume. And, and so, yeah. And so it was a, uh, it was, it was, I needed to be reminded, even in those early days, of my first love, you know, so that, that, so that that would be rekindled, and it would continue to, to burn brightly, and then she came a year later, and then like three or four years later, we were married, and to this day, uh, 28, 28 years later, or, or, yeah, 28 years later, um, I still need that, you know, she uh, I had to go get something at Bass Pro Shop last night, and she just jumped in the car and went with me, and, and it was just an opportunity to just rekindle uh, that love, to be reminded of my first love. Um, and so, thank you. Thank you. Here, you can, you can take it with you. Right. Um, So Jesus writes this letter to remind the church 
of our first love. And folks, we need that. We don't just need that theoretically because we're a church and this is written to churches and so it's for us. I'm telling you, River Church, we need to be reminded of our first love. Jesus begins this letter to the church with, um, with, with these emphatic, with these encouraging, or with these empathetic, rather, words. He says, I know. In, in, in the first verse that, that, uh, that, that Danelle read, he says, I know. I, I know all the things that you do. Jesus says that to us. I, I, know, I, I know, I've seen your hard work. He says, I've seen your patient endurance. Jesus says that to us rather empath uh, empathetically. I, I know. I, I get it. I understand. He says, I'm, I'm watching. You need to hear that today. Jesus is saying, I understand. I know. I'm, I'm empathetic toward your burdens. I, 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 I get it. I know how you've served me. I know how hard you've worked to keep the faith. I know. I know. And in the passage that we just read, Jesus, there are really three parts to it. Jesus offers uh, words of compliment. And we, we, will, we will look at that. And, and then he, he, because he cares for us, he, he offers words of, of criticism and critique. And we will look at those. And then, and then the third section of this brief letter, he offers words of instruction. Like, well, now what do we do? And he tells us, this is what you are to do. So, so let's work through that. Folks, Jesus wrote this letter to Ephesus, but Jesus wrote this letter for us. First of all, the, the, the compliment. The compliment. Jesus says, you're hardworking. You're, you're, you're faithful. As I said earlier, some of, some of you here, you have you've been following Jesus for decades. And, and Jesus says, I know. I've, I've watched you. I, I commend you. Some of you have, have only in the last year or so, you've been following Jesus, but you've been working at it. And, and you've, been, you've been faithful. And, and Jesus says, I know. The Christian life can be described in this way as a slow and steady walk in the same direction. The, the Christian life is not always a, a high. It's, it's, it's not always uh, the, 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 the best time in your life. Uh, a, your Christian walk is not always like, I've never felt so loved by Jesus and, and things have never gone uh, better than they are going now. That is... That is not the Christian life. The Christian life is really, for those of us who endure to the end, the Christian life is a, a slow and steady walk in the same direction for a lifetime. And, and even as you see people peel off and, and fall by the wayside and, and choose other directions and go their own way, the Christian life is a slow and steady, plodding sort of walk in the same direction. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I know. He says, you, you are a loyal people. You are a devoted people. River Church is, is made up of faithful people. And Jesus commends that. In fact, throughout Scripture, God honors God rewards the hard work of faith. The steady, plodding, loyal, faithful, hard work of faith. Here's God's heart for you. If you've been, if you've been faithful to the church for, for so many years, you've been faithful, some, some of you, to River Church for, for its entire existence, this is a different passage, but look at God's heart. This is Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica, and he's speaking about the same thing. He says, as we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work. And we think of your loving deeds 
And we think of your enduring hope, the hope that you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, throughout Scripture, God commends this. He he, <clears throat> he rewards this, this, this sort of faithful, faithfulness and, 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 and loving deeds and enduring hope. You're, you're steady and true. You're going to finish the race that you've started. You're, you're in a slow and plodding and deliberate way. Your Christian walk, it's just, it's faithful. And, and God rewards that. And that's what Jesus is saying in the beginning of this letter. He's saying, you're hardworking. You're faithful. I see that. And, and, then, and then he commends, uh, he commends something else. He commends the fact that you have studied the Bible and you know what you believe. I'm sorry, let me go back. Verse 2, it says, I know, verse 2, I know, I know all the things you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. But then look at this. I know you don't tolerate evil people. And what he's talking about isn't like people that are mean. Um, he's talking about people that, that are deliberately preaching a false gospel. Deliberately mishandling um, the word of the Lord. He's saying, I know how you don't tolerate that. You've examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. You have discovered they are liars. What is, what is Jesus commending here? He's commending the fact that, that, that you're faithful and true to God's word. You're not lazy about it. You, 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 you want me to, to preach God's word accurately. And, and you want to go home and, and, and study God's Word and know what it really says. You don't want to make stuff up. You don't want, you don't want to just hear somebody uh, tickling your ears. But, but you're actually faithful to, to, to doctrine, to, to what the Bible says. And Jesus commends that. And that's true of many of you here at River Church. You... You, you would maybe even say, I'm here because I want to hear God's word preached. And I, I want to hear it preached accurately. And I, I want to dive deep into scripture. And I, I, that's what I want, Randy. And, and, and that's why you're here. And, 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 and Jesus says, I commend that. I like that about you. That is admirable. You've studied the Bible. You know what you believe. You are, you are a people who take seriously God's word. You want to be taught and you want to learn. And Jesus says, well done. There's a third thing that Jesus commends in the opening of this letter. And he compliments. He, he, he commends the fact that you have endured hardship <clears throat> for the sake of Christ. It says that in in verse, uh, verse 3, you have patiently suffered for me without quitting. And, and that's some of you here. Some of you here, you have, you have, <clears throat> um, you have uh, received uh, hostility uh, from, from, maybe, uh, from maybe family members. Maybe because you come here. Or because you're a Christ follower, or maybe uh, you have uh, a uh, maybe you have a mom who is hostile towards you because uh, she doesn't like your brand of Christianity, or she she thinks you're maybe she calls you a fake or a fraud. And 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 I know I know that that, that in a number of you here you receive hostility, you suffer for being a Christian. Maybe from family, maybe from, from people at work. Uh, and, and Jesus says, he says, I know. I, I, I see it. Jesus says, I see what you go through simply for being a Christian. I see how you uh, tolerate abuse. How you're gracious in the midst of trials. Trials that come uh, not because of bad decisions you've made, but because you're a Christ follower. And Jesus commends that. He says, I understand. I was mistreated too, Jesus says. The point is, some of you have, have, have made sacrifices in order, to, in order to follow Jesus. 
Some of you have made uh, sacrifices financially in order to support the church. And Jesus says, I know. Don't think that goes without, without notice. Jesus says, I reward that. I, I commend you. So, so in this first section, Jesus offers compliments. He, he commends us as faithful people, as, as truth-telling people, as people who have sacrificed in small ways, a few of you in really big ways, for the sake of the gospel. And Jesus commends that. The second, the second section of this passage, this letter, is, uh, is really criticism. It's, it's loving, but it's a critique. And, he, and Jesus does that. He critiques us simply because he loves us. I, I have a hard time critiquing people. I don't like to do that. From, from, from the pulpit, maybe. But one-on-one, -on -one, pointing out things in your life that I think ought to be different, that's kind of hard for me. Um, because I, I don't always feel the confidence that it's going to come across in love. But what you need to know, as Jesus critiques us this morning, and as I point this out, it is done out of love. Jesus says, I want the best for you. And I believe Jesus is saying this, where we are at right now spiritually, it's not the best for us. Jesus wants more and better for us. Not from us, but for us. Verse 4. I have this complaint against you. I have this complaint against you, Jesus says. And what is the complaint? It's not what I, I would expect if I was going to meet with Jesus and he was going to critique me. This isn't what I would think, where I would think he would go first. But, but here's what he says. He says, my complaint against you is this. You don't love me as you did at first. And you don't love one another as you did at first. Jesus is saying, you, you have a tragic flaw. One tragic, one tragic flaw that will make your, your faithfulness, your, your, your loyalty, um, all of the hard work that you have put in. Jesus actually says, you have one tragic flaw that will make all of that worthless in the end. Look how far you have fallen, he says. Look how different you are now than you used to be, is, is what, he's really, what he's really saying. He critiques us. He says, number one, you don't love me. Jesus says, you don't love me as you used to love me. If we're, true, if we're honest with one another, what we would say, some of us, some of us, we would say, I'm doing, but I'm not really loving. I'm doing but I'm not really loving. You're, you're going through the motions spiritually, but your heart really isn't in it right now. You, you're, being, you're being loyal because you're loyal people, and I love that about you. And you're, you're being faithful because you're faithful people, but it's out of an obligation. That's what Jesus is saying. You've lost your first love and now you're just doing it because you feel like you have to. Not because you want to. Only raise your hand on the inside now, not on the outside as I ask this question. But are you a little bored right now, spiritually? Years ago when I was, this was... 15 or 20 years ago when I was a when I was a worship I was a pastoral musician I was, I was a worship leader a minister of music I wrote a song and I haven't sung it in a long long time and I'm not going to sing it today but, but I, this is the line that I penned and it came to mind this week 
I, it, 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 was a, it was a line in a song, and it said, a, a disciple is a fraud when he speaks of his love while dreaming of when he might stray, when he might go do something else. And, and how many of us are really in that place right now? We, we speak of our love for Jesus, but we dream of of going a different direction, of, of doing something else, of kind of moving on. And Jesus says, I, there's this one tragic flaw that I see in you. you. You have lost your first love for me. You don't love me as you used to. But then he points out a second, a sort of part B. And I'm going to guess that if you're quite familiar with this passage, you may never have even noticed this part B. And it says, not only Jesus, Jesus says, not only have you lost your first love for me, you don't love one another. You don't love the church like you used to. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. A Christian ethic is that the church, we love one another dearly, and it's evangelistic. People see it, and they, they realize authenticity, true Christ followers, a different passage. By this, all people will know that you are my, my disciples. These are the words of Jesus. If you have love for one another. It's a Christian teaching, a Christian ethic, a Christian truth or belief that, that the church, we, we love one another with this, this first sort of love. And Jesus says, you've lost that. The fact is, a church, a loveless church, is no longer a church. I've come to realize that, that for a person who, who has has this, this newness about their, their, this first love for the church. Man, you, you can't keep him away. You can't keep her away from the church. They're going to be here all the time. And I see this. I see this progression in, in your lives. I see this progression in my life as there's a, this, 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 these high moments of our love for one another. You, when, when you're there, when there's this newness and this freshness and this first love that you have, man, you can't keep that person away from the church. Conversely, the one whose love for the church is growing cold, man, he'll find any reason to stay away. There are a million things we could do with our time besides connect with the body of Christ. Now, now, why is Jesus so concerned about this? Yet, yes, he wants the best for us. But, but why is Jesus so concerned about this? Because he gives us this dire warning. He says this, If you don't repent, if you don't repent from this, your, your, the fact that you've lost your love for me and your first love for me and, and, and the fact that you've lost your first love for one another. I mean, Jesus has already acknowledged you're faithful. Uh, you're long-suffering. You're patient. You're, you've made sacrifices. You're, you're doctrinally astute. You understand the Bible. You preach the gospel accurately. He's already pointed all that out. He's already given us kudos for all that. Well done. But then tragically he says, however, if you don't repent of the fact that you've lost your first love for me, and you don't repent of the fact that you have lost your first love for one another, for the church, for the people sitting next to you, he says, if you don't repent of that, tragically he says, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Number one, let me say, I, I'm, not, I'm not even exactly sure what that means, but number two, it sounds really, really tragic. But then he goes on and he says, um, 
But to everyone who is victorious, in other words, to, if you do repent of that, if you do return to your first love, verse, uh, the, the bottom part of verse 7, he says, to everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Once again, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but that's what I want. I don't want to be like a lampstand that is removed. I want to be the recipient of this fruit from the tree of life. That's why Jesus is, is so concerned because this is, there's so much at stake here. So what do we do? The, 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 third, the third section is Jesus' instruction. And what he says is this. He says, he says, remember the days of your first love and return to that. Your, your original intent, your, your first motive, the, the reason that you came to Christ in the first place. He says, remember that. Return to that. If we could for a moment just consider in your own life, in your own personal life, in the, in the quietness and the privacy of your, own, of your own heart right now, consider how much you've changed. Look at the simple matters in your life that, that have changed. I don't know. You know. I don't know. God knows. Are the things that are the things that you never used to do, never even considered doing that that now you find natural, now you find easy, now they don't really bother you anymore. Maybe things you now say, maybe places that you now go that used to be off limits. Used to be you wouldn't consider that. There there, there are there are days where I am tempted to sin, and I think, but to sin, to sin like that will, will distract, will, will pull me away from this, this, this sense of relationship that I have with Jesus. Like, I'm going to pray later, and it's going to be a sweet time, and it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, there's going to be a closeness to Jesus, and I don't want to miss that. I, I, that's better. Jesus is better than this sin that I'm contemplating. But then, but then there, there comes a day in your life, in my life, where, where, where that's no longer better. My love, my closeness with Jesus is no longer sweeter. And therefore the allure of sin becomes my first choice. We sang today on, on the altar of my praise May there be no higher name, Jesus. And that's what we're talking about. So, so every one of us, our lives, your choices, your affections, your, your priorities, it's like this altar of praise. And, and what we're saying when we sing that song is, may you be the highest, may you be the chief, may you on the altar of praise that is my life, Jesus, may you get the, the highest praise. But when our love grows cold, when, when Jesus really is no longer as sweet as he used to be, other things take precedent. Other things take priority. Are there things you used to do that now you've quit doing because of a coldness, an aloofness toward Jesus? Are, are there are there things like like deep seasons of prayer and 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 relationships that drew you closer to Jesus that you things that you used to do that that now you've quit doing you're just too you're too busy that that was sweet those were spiritual highs but 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 I've quit that I let's face it some of us we're we're on the we're on the edge. Where maybe we don't even haven't admitted it to maybe you haven't admitted it to yourself, but you're you're on the the edge and and you're considering and you're contemplating uh, a, a direction in life that will that will put you over the edge that that will 
that will, will, will finally cause you to stray from Christ. And so Jesus, his instructions are, consider from, from, where, you have, from where you have come. Consider where you were. Consider where you are now. And Jesus says, return. Return to your first love. At all costs. What, whatever it takes, Jesus says, return. J just, like, just like when I was a 19-year-old young man and I would, I would hang pictures of Lydia on the wall and then I would, I would reread the letters that she had sent to me and, and be reminded once again of, of her love for me and, and, and my love for her. And, and frankly, it, it was easy, but I still needed that. It wasn't like she was hard to love. But I still needed that. I needed the rekindling. I needed the reminding. And that's what Jesus is inviting you today. Inviting you to today. It's this way with my relationship, with your relationship with Jesus. Jesus says, remember and return. He says to not do so would be a tragic, tragic mistake. I... Uh, I remember the days when, when spirituality for me was, 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 was brand new and, 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 and was, was, was fresh and, and it meant all the world to me. And, and I, I, I came to faith in Jesus at a, at a fairly early age in life um, and, and, and grew up under, under great teaching and great leadership. But when I went off to college... Um, it was it was this it was this um, maturing of my faith. There was a newness to it. Now I'm an adult. Now I'm on my own. My parents' faith. My my uh, all of the, the the elders that spoke into my life as a child. I've left them behind. Now is my faith my own? So so in '87 and in '88 I was there at college, and, and I was it was there was a, a freshness. A, a newness. Uh, it, it meant all the, the world to me. And I remember back during those college years when, when being discipled was so precious and, and, and the call of discipling other, other guys uh, in my dorm was a priority. And, and when worship and leading worship was a delight and when spending time with, with brothers in Christ in the dorm room who would encourage my mind. Uh, that was, I was way better than spending time with the, the party crowd in the dorm. And, and, and Jesus says, remember back to that. The newness, the freshness, and return to that. So that's what I invite you to today. I, I invite you in the in the quietness and the privacy of your own heart to, to take seriously Jesus' warning. He says, if you don't, if you don't repent of this, tragic will be the end result. He says, but on the other hand, if you do, if you repent and, and you, you return and you rekindle your love for me, Jesus says. But he doesn't just say that. He says, if you rekindle your love for one another, then he says, great will be your reward in heaven. You'll eat from this tree of life in paradise for eternity with God. Man, I want that. I, I, I so want that for you. There's nothing optional. There, there's, there's nothing... This is of first-hand importance. This invitation. This warning. This instruction. So I, I gave you three... Uh, I gave you three uh, uh, thoughts on, on prayer um, last week because this, this is a sermon series on prayer. So we're going to end with three prayer hacks today. But these specifically are how to rekindle 
your love for God. Okay, so you can write these down, and you can remember them, or you can watch the video later and write them down then. But these are three ideas, three prayer hacks, how you can rekindle your first love for God. It's, it's, it's easier, I suppose, to rekindle your love for your spouse. You say, well, we're just going to, we're going to spend time together. We're going to go, go eat together. We're going to make a run to Bass Pro Shop together. We're going to go to the beach and walk for the day. We're going to, you know, but how, how do I do that with God, Randy? How do I rekindle my love for Jesus? How do I rekindle my love for the people of Jesus? And so... So, so three ideas, and then, then we'll pray. Uh, number one is this. Uh, spend time praying about your heart condition rather than your physical condition. Pray about your heart condition rather than your physical condition. Here's what I mean by that. We tend to spend 90% of our time in prayer. Uh, if you pray, we tend to spend 90% of our, of our time in prayer praying for our physical, physical condition, praying for our finances, uh, praying for our, our health and wellness, uh, praying for our kids, uh, praying for the future, and all that stuff is good, and God cares deeply about all that, and you should, pray all, you should pray much about that. But what I am inviting you to do, if you're going to rekindle your love for Jesus, is pray about your heart condition. Say, God, you know my heart. You know the coldness of my heart? You know the brokenness of my heart? You know the wickedness of my heart? God, would you heal my heart? Prayer hack, prayer hack number two. I encourage you to pray with delight rather than duty. Delight rather than obligation, rather than duty. Pray with delight rather than duty. I would liken it to a cold marriage where the spouse comes home every night, but long ago he, she quit coming home with delight. Now it's just a sense of duty. I invite you, I encourage you to pray with delight rather than duty. What does that mean specifically? Uh, what it means specifically is don't pray when you don't feel like praying. Now that can get you in trouble if you never, ever, ever feel like praying, right? I understand that, but, but pray when it's a delight, when it makes you happy, when there's an authenticity to it, even if, even if there's a brokenness to it. And the third and final tip or hack I have as you pray, as you attempt to rekindle your love, your first love for, for God, the third idea is to pray over memories of when your faith was fresh. I kind of go through the record books with God. Go through the, 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 the family album in your mind and, and say, God, remember back, remember back in 88 when I was 19 and, and man, everything was fresh. Everything was new and I just couldn't get enough. Or maybe you'd say... God, remember, remember last year when, when I was just praying every day and, and, and your word was so fresh. I want, I want that again, God. Pray through those memories. God, remember, remember back when seven years ago when, when River Church was brand new and I just loved the people and I wanted to, like, my, my love for them was a first sort of love. I want that again, God. I encourage you to to pray over memories of when your faith was fresh. And ask that God would, would return you to those days and those ways. Jesus says, I commend you. I commend you on your faithfulness. I commend you on your hard work. He says, however, I must point out, you have strayed from your first love for me, and if you don't repent, tragic 
will be the end. Let's pray.